Welcome to CIHT Podcasts. Electric lights have revolutionized our lives, but there is a toll on wildlife and human health. Research just out has revealed the main sources of artificial light polluting the sky. I'm really thrilled to be speaking with Dr. Christopher Kaiba, who led the research. He is based at the German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam. Christopher's research and insights on light pollution are fascinating. I'm your host, Justin Ward. So over 10 days in the city of Tucson in Arizona in the US, something changed with street lighting. Can you tell me what the thinking was behind the research and the findings from it? Just to give a little bit of background, I'm a physicist and I studied light in the outdoor environment. And so I've been looking at how light is changing, for example, with conversions to LEDs. And we know that the world is getting brighter. Most countries are getting brighter. On average, throughout the whole world, it's increasing at about 2% per year. So where does that 2% come from, right? Is it, is it conversions of street lights? Is it new stuff being installed, right? What, what's causing it? That's a big question we had. And we don't know the answer to that, but we, because we also don't know what makes up the light that we have right now. And so we really would like to understand what makes up the light we see from satellites. And as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, also what makes up the light that comes back down from the sky. So, you know, in the ideal case, you would do something like just turn off all the street lights and see how the satellite images or the, the sky brightness changes and then turn them back on and then instead go and turn off all the car lights and see what happens, right? And that was actually done during the Second World War by the American Military College. But it's the kind of thing you can do in wartime that would never happen now <laughs> because nobody would accept that we're all just going to have to go turn our car lights off or go into our houses and, and put all our blinds at the same time or something. You can do that during a war maybe, but not, not during peacetime. So we had the idea, well, you don't necessarily have to turn all the lights off if you have them on a dimmer and you know exactly by how much you're changing it. And so that's sort of what we did. We looked for a number of cities that have dimmable LED systems with a workable control system installed. And uh, we worked with a number of cities and eventually Tucson uh, worked out to be the best. And we took a big 10 day period so that we would remove the uncertainty about the weather. They spent six days in a dim condition and four days in a bright condition. And so we got three nights in the dim condition, one night in the bright condition and two nights that were standard, all within about the two week period when there was no moonlight. And what were the findings from that? I should mention before I say the results that, that Tucson has converted all of their streetlights uh, to um, an LED system that's dimmed at night. And if we had been able to do something like this before with a high pressure sodium lighting, we would have probably got a quite different result. Um, so that bearing that in mind that Tucson has a really, really good street light system, it's really well designed, it's in the direction of sustainable lighting. Uh, with that in mind, after midnight, the light from the city of Tucson street lights makes up about 13% of the total emissions to space. And uh, based on our direct analysis, really a very small fraction, only two or 3% of the light coming back down to earth from the sky although that would depend a little bit on where in the city you were or where outside of the city. So street lighting was quite a small component of the light pollution. What are the impacts, do you think, for that? Or what are the lessons for policymakers on that? A couple of people have asked me this on Twitter today, but now that the results have come out, it's important that we fix street lights, that we get them from uh, an older version that's shining light up into the sky, for example, into a really well-designed system that's shining light where it's needed in an appropriate amount. But the point is that once we do that, we're not done, right? The city is still going to have a lot of light emissions and a lot of light pollution. So after you fix street lights, you need to start thinking about the other types of light inside the city. And uh, that's where it becomes potentially a bit more of a challenge because the, the great thing about street lights is you have sort of one operator that's responsible for, you know, these in the case of Tucson, 20,000 different street lights, right? When you talk about all the other lights in the city on people's houses, security lighting, parking lots, sports fields, you have to talk to, you know, it needs to be the whole city that works together on this problem. And it's not so simple as, you know, someone in city hall just makes a decision and then it's done. But you are right, the gains from LED lights have been considerable. In the UK, there's been a quite a focus on the carbon benefits, the cost-saving benefits, the energy-saving benefits. 
but you did point out that the I mean, it's interesting The International Dark Sky Association estimates that 35 percent of artificial light is wasted. Um, um, and what can be done to make sure that certainly with LED street lighting, that it's not wasted? What kind of solutions are there? With street lighting, the, the basics are that it's really important that it, that it only shine downward. From the perspective of a driver or a pedestrian, it's, it's even better not just that it shines downward, but that it really does not extend past about two or three poles ahead. So that if you have the situation where you have wet pavement, you don't get the glare of the lights going up for a kilometer ahead of you. So that's an example where we're cutting down on the light, even if you just block it rather than, uh, than having an efficient design with a lens or something. It reduces the total amount of light and lets people see better. So it's important that the light be directed in the right direction. Then it's very important that we have the, the right amount of light on our streets, that we don't overlight them. And this is where um, uh, this is a, a question that's a, a real open question because the standards that are being applied around the world are, are based on consensus, mainly from players in industry. They're not really based on scientific studies. And when you think about how cars have developed over recent years and the, how the number of crashes is decreasing and the severity of crashes is decreasing, that's because of lots of different innovation in, in car and city design. So the amount of light that we need to stay safe now could be potentially quite a bit less than it was in 1980 when maybe somebody did a study on highway collisions in lit or unlit conditions, right? So this is the kind of thing that we're gonna have to be working on over and over and over again as we go forward. And as we move to, for example, autonomous cars at some point in the future, then we're gonna need lights for pedestrians and cyclists, but we don't necessarily need street lighting anymore. What we would need then is pedestrian and uh, cyclist lighting. So I think that we're going to have to just keep on rethinking over and over again, how do we light our cities effectively? How do we light them beautifully? Lights on cars getting more powerful. And is there a need to light signs? has been a question that's been asked in the UK. And again, the science on that, I think, is still, still not fully established. I mean, there's cases where lighting becomes less effective. I think that many listeners have probably had the experience uh, on a motorway somewhere, especially if you're outside of town, where you have a lit sign that you can't actually read because they didn't dim it in the nighttime. So it's still in the daylight condition. And the words that are written there or the speed limit that's written there are simply not legible because it's so glaring. So it's, it's really always important to think about the, the context of the light and how bright the surroundings are. And a, and a light that would look okay inside the center of a city may be extraordinarily bright and dazzling when it's in the countryside. And connecting to vehicles again, air pollution and the climate emergency have gone up in the public and political agenda across the world, but less so light pollution. Can you tell me how solving light pollution might actually help addressing some of those other challenges? It's really a little surprising and disappointing to me that the, that the climate movement and Fridays for Future has not sort of shone more light on the issue of light pollution, because it's one of the few types of pollution where we can really imagine a, a big win in the future that actually makes our lives better, right? So when you talk about not flying as much anymore, that, that may disappoint a lot of people. But having better lighting that makes you feel more secure in your town because it's better designed is just a win for everyone. Um, so once we do this and we, we come to a future where we're using much less light, but it's much more effectively used, the energy that we save could be used in other ways. So for example, reducing the total consumption for light at nighttime will be helpful for reducing the baseline load of electricity that we need at night. That could reduce our reliance on coal or natural gas, for example, or in some cases on nuclear. The other thing is that, that assuming that we still maintain that baseline load for some, for some time, that energy, instead of powering lights and advertisements that nobody even sees because it's at three in the morning, it could be going to storage solutions. So battery banks or charging future autonomous vehicles or uh, other sort of, you know, just kinds of ideas of pumping water up in the nighttime and then, and then draining it down in the daytime as a, as a big energy storage device. So the less energy we use for light, the more energy we have for those types of solutions. Because briefly, the, the, the impacts of light pollution, could you just cover what they are, just in sort of headline terms, really? 
So, so one of the first ones is is in the pocketbook, right? We all pay either as taxpayers for the uh, public lighting or we pay as consumers for private lighting. So that's a lot of money that we're talking about. And the next is the uh, climate and energy that we talked about. If we need to use electricity for light, that means that in many cases we're burning coal or, you know, even if we have an environmental solution like uh, wind farms or solar panels, you still have to produce those things and put them somewhere. So anytime you can simply reduce the energy consumption, that's going to be better than, you know, needing to go out and build new renewable energy supply. The next impact is on the environment. So uh, we tend not to think about light in a negative way because as humans, we're, we're scared, scared of the dark. We're much more comfortable in daytime. But many animals are active at night. And so having these lights out there is just a, a massive change compared to the time in which life evolved. When in the nighttime, you would have had light from stars, the moon, uh, the Milky Way, and air glow. So many animals are disoriented by light at night. Migrating birds, for example, are very susceptible to, for example, light pillars that people shine, um, these beacons that they put up as part of a celebration or something. Those can attract birds and uh, in, in some cases have really deadly consequences, up to uh, thousands or even tens of thousands of birds being killed in a single night at such a light. They affect a whole range of animals. Insects, of course, are very strongly attracted to light. Everybody who's, who's seen a moth flying around a flame or, or had mosquitoes come into their house because the window was open has, uh, has experienced that. And on mammals as well, even daytime active mammals, when you are exposed to light at nighttime, especially for humans that, that aren't exposed to sunlight during the day because we spend so much of our time indoors, our bodies are not getting the light signal that we evolved to expect. So our, uh, the mammal body expects that you're going to get a real bright light at the start of the day and signals it's time to wake up, time to, you know, um, change various hormone levels to get you ready for the day, your blood pressure goes up, all sorts of things like that. Uh, when we don't get that signal of bright light in the morning, and then when we don't have the signal of darkness in the evening, our body just gets a little bit confused as to what time it is. And the people who tend to wake up early, it's not so much of an issue for them, but the people who tend to go to bed late and wake up late have really shifted much later than we used to be back before we had so much electric light and spent so much time indoors. So we have this social jet lag where we have a mismatch between when we ought to sleep and when we do sleep that causes really a lot of problems for health, for concentration of kids in school, um, just all over the place. So yeah, light has really, really powerful effects on, on humans and on the environment, and it makes sense to get it right. That's a final question. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned wartime conditions. And obviously, I think of London, I think of my father living in London, just at the end of the war with, with experiencing blackout blinds and so on. But the pandemic has altered traffic volume, certainly, and air pollution has been a, a study of that, particularly back when lockdowns were in place across about a third of the world's population back in March. And again, sadly, now, what was the impact on light levels then, light pollution levels during the pandemic? And then I'd like to sort of connect that a bit to your Radiance Light Trends website and what people can find out for themselves. So sorry to put two questions in one. <laughs> no problem. Let's start with the Radiance Light Trends because like you said, people can do it for themselves. So if you Google for Radiance Light Trends, you'll find this web application that we developed that allows anybody to look at the night light satellite data that's been acquired since about uh, digitally, at least since 1992. The newer satellite that we have, which I would recommend looking at is from 2012 until now, and we have monthly data sets that are there. So, so you can see for each month how things changed. And there are some hints that in some places, for example, in Wuhan, China, there was a decrease in the amount of light to some extent. This work is still really new and, and uh, in my opinion, isn't so complete yet. Um, we do know that the sky became darker in a lot of places. To a large extent, though, we assume that this is due to reduced air pollution, because when you have a lot of air pollution, that can scatter the light back down to Earth. 
But we do know of specific cases, for example, in Krakow in Poland, where the city turned lights off late at night after midnight or something like that, because they, they knew there's nobody out on the streets right now. So why are we bothering to light then? For the most part, though, I think that people tend not to, to think about light very much. And so a business owner, for example, may not have thought about the fact that, that they have a light on a timer or just a light that burns all night uh, when we went into lockdown. I mean, there were much more pressing things to be, everyone was concerned about their health, concerned about their families. And so you probably wouldn't have seen a lot of people thinking, wow, you know, this would be a good time to switch off the billboards because I could save some money. So overall, I think that the, the impact of the lockdown on light emissions was, was probably quite small with a few exceptions. So uh, long distance highways, for example, uh, I think there will be some very strong evidence that, that there was a decrease in vehicle traffic and we see decreases in headlights because of that. But for the most part, I think in most cities, I think that if you look at the data, you, you probably won't see much of a difference between March or April in previous years and in this year. Well, thank you very much for your time. I found that personally very fascinating. That was uh, an interview with Christopher Kaiba from the German Research Centre for Geosciences in Potsdam.